Hi, most of you are familiar with the uh, recent guidelines, the update of the European Consensus Guidelines on RDS Management. As you are aware, the first uh, I mean, version of this came up in 2007 and consequent to that, every three years uh, they have been updating this, the same group of others and of course uh, we'll miss Professor Halliday. Uh, the important aspect here is that the guidelines are developed on consensus basis based on currently available evidence and it has become a popular resource for neonatologists around the world. So one request for the others, the group of others who are involved in it is to see if we can be independent of the financial input from CAISI which is supporting this initiative from the beginning. Of course, I mean, uh, if it is used in the right way, there is no impact on the decision making or the value of the guidelines, but it would be much better if we stay clear of market influence when we make such guidelines. That is just my personal comment. Uh, I'll be reviewing the recommendations part and then discuss a little bit about each aspect as applicable. And as has been the case from the beginning, they cover all aspects of newborn care which can impact on RDS management, which is very, uh, very commendable, a good approach. And uh, prenatal care, the recommendations are that the mothers at high risk of premature delivery less than 28 to 30 weeks should be delivered at perinatal centers with experience in management of RDS. So depending on where you work, the setup may vary, the government regulations may vary. For example, in the UAE, we have regulations as to the level of intensive care, what uh, categories of babies can be delivered there. And obviously, you need to recognize what you can do in your unit and <clears throat> in utero transfer is much better than ex utero transfer after stabilizing, even for stabilizing a unit which deals with a few of these babies will not do as well as compared to a bigger unit who deals with this day in and day out. The second point is about women with singleton pregnancy and short cervix in mid-pregnancy. Vaginal progesterone treatment should be uh, used to increase gestational age at delivery as well as reduce the perinatal morbidity and mortality which is in turn linked to the prolongation of gestational age. So most of this is based on the optimum study and other studies before that where they gave vaginal progesterone to the mother and also looked at the immediate outcome as well as neurodevelopmental. There is a potential for improving the uh, gestational age at delivery where there is a risk of preterm birth. So this is widely used as well and it's a safe treatment so it should be encouraged. In women with, symptom, women with symptoms of premature labor, cervical length and accurate biomarker measurement should be considered mainly to prevent unnecessary use of tocolytic drugs and or the antenatal steroids. So this is a very important point when it comes to reuse of antenatal steroids because if you use it the first time when it is not clearly indicated, you are more likely to need it again and actually when the delivery is happening, you may not be able to give it because you are already exhausted your two uh, courses that you may be able to give. I would requ request you to go through my video on update on antenatal steroids to get more details about this but uh, it's very important to be clear about uh, confirming the real risk of premature delivery not have a low threshold just because it is multiple pregnancy or uh, you're over diagnosing the risk and uh, so do go through these uh, cervical length and biomarkers like fetal fibronectin before you actually decide the, this is an observation to feedback to your obstetric team the clinician should offer a single course of prenatal corticosteroids to all women at high risk of preterm delivery from the time pregnancy is considered potentially viable. So this has come down to 22 weeks in many of the developed countries. So if there is a high risk of preterm delivery, even after 22 weeks up to 24 weeks, according to your center, you may consider giving it because research has shown even at 22 weeks, antenatal steroids improve the survival. The gestation cutoff is 34 completed weeks. Of course, the ANT study, uh, the ALP study came up with the recommendation to give steroid between 34 and 36 weeks, but there are subsequent studies where antenatal steroid exposure may result in long-term neurodevelopmental concerns. Most of this is related to studies on babies who received steroids antenatally but went on to deliver close to term. Uh, remember that about 50% of the time when antenatal steroids are given, the premature delivery doesn't happen. That takes us back to the same point here where 
you need to be sure of the risk of preterm delivery before you give steroids and any setting like a maternal urinary infection or any other concerns which necessitate this dose of steroid at that time might itself compound the neurodevelopmental outcome of these babies. I have discussed this in relation to paracetamol use in pregnancy and long-term neurodevelopment because paracetamol is used to treat fever and if the mother has fever we know that there is a cytokine response and this could impact the fetal neurodevelopment. So it's not that paracetamol is causing the uh, neurodevelopmental problem in the baby but it is more the association of paracetamol use. The same association may exist for this antenatal steroid use as well. So of course we shouldn't use steroids on a repeated basis during pregnancy and that's why the consensus is to use a single repeat dose which may be given in threatened preterm labor before 32 weeks if the first course was administered at least one to two weeks earlier. So it's only one repeat that can be given so if don't the obstetrician should not have a low threshold to give the steroids and they should delay as best as they can if they are uh, not sure about whether it's a preterm labor or not. And then the repeat course can be considered one to two weeks after if the preterm delivery becomes imminent. So again, they have to be sure that it is really imminent because they will only be able to use it once. Magnesium sulfate to reduce the risk of cerebral palsy is recommended below 32 weeks and again the gestation cutoff at which you would start giving it is debatable whether you would give it below 24 weeks or you would restrict it to 24 weeks and above. Some people are of the opinion that you can give it for 22 to 24 weeks but uh, I personally feel we can wait till 24 weeks for mag self mainly because the risk of cerebral palsy is very high anyway before uh, 24 weeks the survival chances are lower and these are the babies where magnesium sulfate related gut motility could affect feeding, uh, feeding tolerance and other issues as well. The clinician should consider short term use of tocolytic drugs in very preterm pregnancies to allow completion of a course of prenatal steroids and also to consider in utero transfer to perinatal center. So the tocolytics should be used in settings where you gain from it. So you don't want to arrest preterm labor where there is a setting of infection, where there is chorioamnionitis or where there is a risk to the maternal health. But if there is a possibility of prolonging the pregnancy, uh, getting the steroid dose to the maximum benefit or to allow you to transfer, then you use the tocolytics. So I request you to share this segment of it with your obstetric colleagues. Uh, the same applies to the delayed cot lamping which will come in the labor room criteria next. In terms of the labor room care, the recommendations include obviously uh, deferring the clamping the umbilical cord. So delayed umbilical cord clamping, we can also name it as late umbilical cord clamping or the physiologic umbilical cord clamping. So the cord clamping should be delayed unless there is a real contraindication. So that is physiological. You can review my videos on delayed cord clamping for more detail, but it is physiologic. It is the blood that should be coming back to the baby. And in a premature baby where hemodynamic disturbances are much more likely, the lack of this 20 to 30 percent blood volume will impact the baby's outcome and that's why uh, if you miss out the 20 30 ml of uh, milk uh, the blood that the baby is supposed to get back these babies can have a higher risk of ivh the risk of jaundice is very minimal you don't need to be worried and even though there is a mild polycythemia because the blood volume increases at the same time it's not going to affect the uh, risk of hyperviscosity in these babies so please uh, reiterate that you should do delayed cot clamping. Again, uh, teach your obstetric team that these babies, when they are premature, don't cry. They are not vigorous at delivery. Uh, encourage them to feel the cord pulsation and if the cord pulse rate is more than 100, they can safely wait 30 seconds to one minute. Again, the labor room temperature should be clearly adjusted to 24 to 25 degrees as recommended and uh, OT temperature as well. So you need to negotiate Educate your obstetric team, the importance of this and don't leave a choice. It's uh, almost like what the baby should be getting. You shouldn't deprive the baby of this. Another important point is the stem cells uh, that this uh, fetal blood is rich in. All the immunoglobulin that was transferred to the mother, the dose that will come is like 20 to 30 ml per kilo more of the blood volume, which has this high, uh, very rich in stem cells as well as immunoglobulin which will play a big role in helping these babies cope with the stressful newborn period. So please, please uh, don't miss out on delayed cot clamping. 
Cod milking can be considered in babies more than 28 weeks, but in the babies who are younger than that, there is a risk of uh, possibly increased risk of IVH, as shown by uh, Anup Kattaria and his team. So we have to be cautious about cod milking in the smallest babies. Uh, for the resuscitation part, TP's device should be preferred rather than bag and mask. So obviously the benefits are clear that you adjust the pressure better, you can deliver PEEP better, the inflation time is regulated better. There is no role for uh, prolonged inflation at delivery, uh, sustained inflation is not recommended. Spontaneously breathing baby should be stabilized using CPAP, so don't immediately intubate the baby. If they are apneic or bradycardic, start giving ventilation breaths and the expert consensus is to start with CPAP pressure of 6 cm water with a PIP of 20 to 25 cm. So obviously if the baby continues to need IPPV, then you intubate these babies. Oxygen for resuscitation should be controlled using a blender. So this is not an option anymore. Any unit taking care of newborn should have blenders in the labor room and in the NICU as well. Uh, we should use an initial FAO2 of 0.3 for babies less than 28 weeks gestation and 0 0.1, 0 0.21 to 0 0.3 for those 28 to 31 weeks. So room air is adequate for more than 32 weeks. So it's important that we start with some oxygen for the smaller premature babies and there are still studies on uh, I mean, torpedo 2 and so on which are looking at ranges in between. So the torpedo 1 had looked at 100% versus room air versus the torpedo 2 is giving different cutoffs. So we can go 30 to 60% maybe to start with and because the oxygen uh, is important uh, to maintain the airway open as well in the small babies and it has been shown that a saturation of 80% or more to be achieved within 5 minutes is important for a better prognosis. We can consider titrating starting with uh, 30 to 40% and titrate down. So the smaller the baby, the higher the need for this slightly increased FAO2 at delivery. We should hopefully get more clear information on this soon. Intubation should be reserved for babies not responding to PPV via face mask or nasal prongs. Uh, there are some resources looking at laryngeal mask airway for the initial inflation. Again, for the bigger babies, most you people are uh, suggesting we can use LMA above 1.5 kilos and experience is increasing. Once we get the zero size, probably this will increase as well. So the seal efficacy is much better. If you are using a face mask, remember that the trigeminofacial reflex can cause reflex bradycardia. So be careful about how you hold the mask not to press too hard and to relax and make the seal effective in an appropriate way. And there are also studies which are looking at use of high flow at the time of delivery. Uh, that's not established practice that can be considered in your unit if you are able to set it up. Two people uh, doing the IPPV is also beneficial. One person stabilizing and holding the mask with a good seal and the other one doing the bag. If you have facility, go for these options. And uh, plastic bag or occlusive wrapping under the radiant warmer and the humidified gas should be used during stabilization of babies less than 32 weeks gestation to reduce the risk of hypothermia. Hyperthermia should be avoided as well. So some people have looked at servo control temperature regulation. It doesn't change the outcome, but anything that improves the awareness, the focus on the labor room temperature, the focus on using the warmer properly, using the plastic bag. Sometimes when we use a thermal mattress, babies have been shown to become hyperthermic, so that should be avoided. So we have to be watching for both hypo and hyperthermia prevention.